So today's message is God is near to the brokenhearted. It's one of the promises from Psalms that when we are brokenhearted that God is near to us and when someone we know or people we don't know are brokenhearted, the promise is that God is near to them. Now, this is a subset of a much bigger picture. The bigger picture is God is near to everybody. But often if you get to a spot where you're, broke in, where you're brokenhearted, you're not sure anymore if God is actually near to you because things are going so badly. There's so much pain. Um, it may be physical pain, it may be emotional pain, but, uh, but you don't know how you'll survive sometimes. And, and when people are in that state, the Bible wants to be very clear, God has not abandoned you. In fact, God is near. God is near to the brokenhearted. So that's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna start in, uh, in Leviticus, so if you're not used to opening your Bible, uh, you'll be able to find Leviticus because it's one of the first few books. Uh, there's Genesis, Exodus, and then Le Leviticus. And if you decide, say during Lent or at the start of the year or on your birthday or sometime you're gonna read through the Bible, I no longer recommend that unless uh, you're, uh, you've got more stamina than most. Uh, what I do recommend is that you read through the Bible until you get into a spot where it just feels like you're slogging along and then skip that section because there's some parts of the Bible that were not meant to be read. They were, they were records. Some parts of the Bible are census records and there's very few of us who go to uh, online these days and say, can I just read the census data for a couple, three hours? Um, or, and certainly very few people say, I want to read all the census data. Or, I want to go down to the title company and read all the titles. Well, you don't usually do that. You don't usually care about your neighbor's genealogy. When they invite you over to, so that they can explain their family tree, it's a little bit like it was 70 years ago when someone invited you over to watch their slides. Uh, you would catch a virus or, uh, ha sorry, you, it's a big bowling tournament and you have to go. There's going to be one lame excuse or another, but you just don't want to go to an event like that unless it's someone like my great uncle Vigo, who when he took pictures of people and showed movies of what he'd taken, you could tell who there were because you knew whose hat was whom and all there was in the family picture was a line of hats and sky. So it was worth it to go to his slides and photo deals, but have you found Leviticus yet? So we're in Leviticus, which is one of the books that was not meant for your enjoyment, to read and be edified. So if you're reading through the Bible in a year, uh, it's helpful to, if you get to a spot where you're bogging down, jump to the next chapter or the next book and keep going because the Word of God is really helpful and awesome. But some days, the part that you're in may not be for that day. And coming back to it on a different day might be helpful. Leviticus 13, we're gonna start in verse 45. Now we're in the middle of a whole bunch of rules and we're gonna look at just one rule in God laid out for the people of Israel. The person who has the leprous disease shall wear torn clothes. So uh, makes it kind of easy. You either need to go to a really high-end store with really expensive clothes or you go to a really low-end store but don't get clothes that are normal, your clothes have to be torn. And let the hair of that person's head be disheveled. Easy for some of us, harder for others, but let your hair be all mussed up. See, it doesn't muss up very easy. Uh, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, 
unclean. So everywhere you go, you announce to people, I'm coming through, turn your back on me, scatter. Don't stick around because I have to go that way and you don't want to get close. Verse 46, the person shall remain unclean as long as they have the disease. Let's come back to that after we finish this one verse. The person shall live alone, dwelling outside the camp. You have to be outside the city by yourself. How long is this quarantine? It's pretty much till you die. Naaman was cured of leprosy, the only person in his day. Everyone else who had leprosy, according to the scripture, died with it. So for everybody who has leprosy in the time of this writing, it's pretty much a quarantine for life. And leprosy kills very slowly. Eventually, but it disfigures first for a long time. So the status of someone who had leprosy was they had to avoid their family, leave regular society, and announce that they were unclean so that everybody could scatter in their presence. We're going to skip up to Luke. If you're trying to read along, Luke is toward the back of the book. Uh, in this case, in, with these Bibles, the page numbers start over. So when you get to the back of the book where the page numbers are starting over, it's going to be on page 64. Luke 5, your Bible's going to be different if you brought a Bible from home. Uh, Luke 5, verse 12. Once when Jesus was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. Naaman was the only one cured in his lifetime, different era than the era that Jesus was walking the earth. But this person asked for something that no one has been able to do in centuries. Jesus, if you choose, you can make me clean. Verse 13, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I do choose, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. The New Testament says in a couple places that Jesus is the visible likeness of the invisible God. You can't see God. You can tell what God is doing sometimes by observing what's happening, but you can't physically see God. But you can see Jesus, and Jesus shows you what God is like. So one of the things that you understand by looking at the life of Jesus is that God cares for people that no one else knows how to help. People that have to be completely isolated by society or people that society isolates. God goes close to them, close enough to touch, and intervenes in their life. So if you want to know what kind of God do Christians serve? What is God like? You can look to Jesus and see the God that we serve is a God who is not afraid of people who are diseased. It's a God who's not afraid to come into contact with people that everyone else is avoiding. The God that we serve is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So, let's see, verse 14. 
We got, did I read that immediately the leprosy left him? Okay, so the guy who had an incurable disease suddenly cured. Verse 14, Jesus gives him the kind of government instruction that is not gonna go anywhere. Uh, Jesus ordered him to tell no one. He's had to announce that he's unclean everywhere he went. Now Jesus says, don't tell anybody you're clean. Um, how well do you suppose he's going to comply? He's going to behave like the Italians who are under lockdown. Uh, go, he said, Jesus said, show yourself to the priest. And as Moses commanded, make an offering for your cleansing for a testimony to them. So if we read more in Leviticus and other spots of the Bible, we'd discover that there's a whole sequence of things that if a person ever got to the spot where they thought they were cured of their leprosy, they could go to the priests, be certified as being free of this disease, and come back into society. There's a prescribed way of doing it so that um, infection control could be maintained. Jesus tells this man, go to the priest, but don't tell anybody. There's a number of cases in the Bible where Jesus gives this same instruction um, to some parents that Jesus has just read, raised their dead child back to life. And Jesus says, yeah, don't tell anybody. Uh, at a minimum, it's just so Jesus is able to leave without being mobbed. Uh, we know by reading the Bible that most of the people who heard this instruction just ignored it. They were so happy they told everybody they could think of. I want to use an illustration that some of you may not know anything about what I'm talking about because when you think about a car wash, what you think about is getting out your credit card and sitting in the lounge and a whole team of other people are doing the work. And your work is just to have your credit card handy when they're done with the job. That's not the kind of car wash that I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about the kind of car wash that is one step up from your hose in your driveway. So besides your hose in your driveway, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you can drive, not in La Jolla, because all of them have shut down, but you can go down to PB and in Pacific Beach, there's a place where you can drive up and put in some quarters and, and it'll, the machine will turn on and it'll do anything you tell it to around the dial. You can tell the um, sprayer to be very light or to be very heavy. You can tell the foaming brush to start foaming. You can tell a different wand to start uh, putting out a thin mist that'll cause your car to glisten. It's got about eight, 10 settings, but it'll only point to one at a time. If you want the foaming brush and the rinser at the same time, you cannot do that. You have to choose. If you're on the foaming brush, you cannot get the rinser to be putting out water. All right, so hopefully, even if you've never seen any of this weird kind of car wash, you can picture how that box works. Because for many of us, you have put your life at a particular setting and left it there, and you're wondering why things are going the way they are. So, I'm sure not in this assembly, but in one of the other churches that's open today, there were some people caught in traffic and they got cut off and they got mad. And they switched their dial over to anger and they're wondering why everybody's kind of avoiding them. But they're on irritated. And it's pretty easy to just click the dial over to something else. But as long as they're on irritation, they're not gonna be experiencing peace or love or joy.
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, any of the gifts of God's Spirit, the fruit of God's Spirit, is not on the irritation setting. You have to click it over to a different setting. If you've got your uh, setting turned to resentment, and you're wondering why people are kind of a, not being very nice to you, it's because you are broadcasting out that you're the kind of person that most people don't want to get into contact with because you are so poisonous. So the difference between our dial and the dial of the car washes in Pacific Beach is that they don't have anything on their dial that's bad. All the settings down there could be helpful for your car. But imagine a new car wash opening where one of the settings was corrosive acid. You could set that in the car wash, turn it on to corrosive acid, hose down your car, and then wonder why things weren't going so well for you. That's what many people are doing with their lives. They have, instead of setting the dial on purpose to joy, which is not because things are going so great for you, it's just because you chose it. Instead of choosing joy or love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, instead they decided to spin the dial around to something corrosive and spray down their life with it and see how it goes. So you can be in a state of resentment, lack of forgiveness, lots of things that you can see in others aren't helping them. If you choose to set your life on that for a lifetime or for a moment, you're probably gonna block out some of the things that you really would like to receive. And all you have to do, in the car example, is choose to move the setting from resentment back up to peace. And start blessing that really terrible driver. Or kid who lives with you in your house. Or whatever it is. Uh, whatever it is that's caused you to put the setting on something corrosive choose to move the dial up to something that fits better with God who loves you. There are people today who are on this, in the same spot of this man from Luke 5, isolated in our present society. They may have a disease, they may have an opinion. Uh, they may have a disfigurement like this man. But for some reason, society doesn't want to catch what that person has, and society is deciding to quarantine them, isolate them. God is near to them no matter what. Like God is near to you. And there are cases when we simply need to obey the authorities and what's sound. And there are also cases where God will give you a different instruction set that will be important for the moment. And you might not want to talk to the drug dealer but if God impresses you to show compassion to that person, it's worth it. Why don't you stand? God, probably all of us here are brokenhearted about something. And all of us here have skills and abilities where we could help other brokenhearted people 
with something. We're so grateful, God, that you are near to the brokenhearted. And we confess that sometimes we aren't near to the brokenhearted because we've got our setting stuck on resentment or envy or discord or something that God doesn't want us to get anywhere close to the brokenhearted because we would just be spraying them with corrosive material that would not help at all. But sometimes when we can be, come into alignment with you and start loving people that nobody else loves and blessing people that nobody else blesses and giving joy to people who don't have any, sometimes when we are able to start reflecting who you are, you're able to not only uh, allow the brokenhearted to see you as being near, but to experience it through someone else. And we're so grateful when we can be part of that equation. Help us to be wise in what you're calling us to do so that we can be good citizens and follow the government's directives and be near to the brokenhearted when that would be helpful. Thank you for your mercy, God. We praise you. Amen.